Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of the Milken Institute's Center for Strategic Philanthropy, Melissa Stevens. Good morning, everyone. Now, at first glance, Jane Goodall and Brian Sheff may seem like an unlikely pairing. One is a top private equity investor who is perhaps one of the best deal makers of his generation. He's a turnaround mega investor who has mastered the world of enterprise software. The other is an iconic conservationist whose life's work defending our planet has made her a beloved hero of hope. Now Jane and Brian have forged a deep, deep friendship that is rooted in their common commitment to preserving our earth and all of its natural resources. Brian is co-founder and president of Vista Equity Partners, which is one of the best performing PE firms in the world. They have over $31 billion in assets under management and nearly 50 companies uh, in their portfolio. So in aggregate, Vista is the fourth largest enterprise software company in the world. Now Brian is taking his passion and know-how for investing and applying it to his philanthropic efforts, extraordinary efforts. Through the nonprofit that he co-founded and chairs, Global Wildlife Conservation, he is rallying scientists, other conservation organizations, and philanthropists from around the world to help save our planet and all the species on it. So I am thrilled and, and greatly honored to be able to introduce you to Brian Sheff and his dear friend, Jane Goodall. <laughs> That's so great that you guys all clap so loudly for me. <laughs> well, thank you, Melissa. It's so great to be here in Los Angeles, the Milken Conference. And it's so great to be here with my dear friend, Jane Goodall. I think everybody at this point knows a whole lot about Jane and her work and what she's done few key things, and then we're going to watch a short video before we start our, converse, our conversation today. Jane was an intrepid explorer, adventurer, became a scientist, and really taught the world what it is about our incredibly close cousins, the chimpanzee, and in so doing taught us a lot about ourselves. And we're going to talk about that today. She's gone on to become one of the leading advocates for animal protection, for biodiversity, for species preservation. She travels 300 days a year to tell her story and the story of why we need to protect our planet to people all over the world. And she's impacted not just scientists, but through her global programs, JGI and Roots and Shoots, literally hundreds of thousands of children across the world who have created uh, programs to protect the environment in their home country. She's a UN messenger of peace. She is my two children's favorite person. <laughs> off, to, off to you and your wife. <laughs> she is Dame Jane. <laughs> she loves it when I say that. Dame to me is the man who dresses up as a woman in a pantomime. <laughs> well, I wasn't the one who gave that to you. <laughs> so I think we're gonna tee the video. In 1960, a young British woman ventured into the forest of Africa to follow her childhood dream, to find a way to watch free wild animals living their own undisturbed lives. She ended up giving the world a remarkable window into our closest living relatives. She was me. I wanted to come as close to understanding animals as I possibly could.
a small plane over Gombe National Park. And I was absolutely horrified at what I saw. So quickly it seemed, the environment outside the National Park had been utterly destroyed. The trees had gone. And that's when I realized that unless we helped the people to improve their lives, there was no way we could even try to save the precious chimpanzees. This was when we started Take Care or Takari, our community-centered conservation project. Everywhere I went, I met young people who seemed to have lost hope. They all said more or less the same thing. We feel like this because we think you've compromised our future. And so that led into our program for youth, Roots and Shoots. The main message of Roots and Shoots is that every one of us makes a difference every single day. The program has now become a movement that's in 100 countries around the world. One of the things that the Jane Goodall Institute does that I feel is really most important is to try and give people hope, to help people understand that every single day we live, we can make a difference. And together, with everybody making a difference, we can change the world. Well, Jane, we're going to spend a lot of time later talking about all of your conservation efforts, but let's go back to the beginning and tell the story a little bit of how you ended up in Tanzania. Well, <coughs> when I was a tiny little girl growing up in England, I was born loving animals, and I think the key thing here is I had a supportive mother. So she didn't freak out when I took worms to bed with me when I was one and a half. <laughs> she just said we needed to take them out or they'd die. She didn't get mad at me, even though she got so worried about my four-hour absence that she'd called the police. <laughs> but when she saw this excited little girl rushing towards the house with shining eyes, she sat down to hear what I'd been doing, waiting in a hen house to see how a hen laid an egg. Where was the hole big enough? I didn't know. Um, I saw it that day. And so she got books for me about animals, thinking I'd learn to read more quickly. Left school. We didn't have enough money for university. It was just after World War II. And so I did a boring secretarial course. And then I got a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya for a holiday. Worked as a waitress to save up the money to get there. I heard about the late Dr. Lewis Leakey. I think people today think of Richard Leakey, the son, but this is the father, the paleontologist. Uh, people said, Jane, if you were interested in animals, you should meet Louis Leakey. So I went to meet him. He took me all around the Natural History Museum in Nairobi. I think he was really impressed how much I knew, even though I'd just come from England. And guess what? His secretary had left one week before. He needed a secretary. That boring secretarial <laughs> course, yes. And so that led to him offering me this amazing opportunity to go and study chimpanzees. And you had, uh, we have to be careful with how we say it, I was about to say skeleton crew, but you <laughs> didn't have a very, a very big budget, and so you needed help on this first trip, this first foray into the forest. So who did you call on to go with well, you? Well, it wasn't so much needing help. It was that, you know, at that time, Tanzania was Tanganyika. It was, you know, one of the last outposts of the crumbling British Empire. And the British authorities weren't prepared to take responsibility for this young girl on her own. They said, she's got to come with someone. And so who volunteered? That same amazing mother. And she played such an important role because when I was 10, dreaming of Africa, because I just saved up enough money to buy a little second-hand book called Tarzan of the Apes, f fell in love with Tarzan. <laughs> and what did Tarzan do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that's when my dream began. And everybody laughed at me. How will you get there? You don't have money. Africa's far away. World War II is raging. And you're just a girl. But my mother said, if you really want this, you're going to have to work awfully hard, take advantage of opportunity, and never give up. And that's the message I take all around the world, particularly in disadvantaged communities. I wish mum was around to you know, to know how her message has transformed lives. 
So you, you got to the forest, your dream of secretarial work shattered forever. <laughs> I never dreamed of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you and your mom are there with your cook. But yes, we had, we, the people in Kigoma, the nearest little town, you go along the lake shore, and th they said, oh, Jane and her mother must have a cook. There must be somebody there. And so Dominic had been cook for all the different British people, but there was a problem. He loved the cooking sherry. It kept disappearing. <laughs> so they thought, well, Jane and her mother won't have cooking sherry. Um, we couldn't afford anything like that. <laughs> so we'll send Dominic, who's an excellent cook, and it'll be wonderful. It took him less than a week to discover an extremely potent uh, beverage made of fermented bananas. <laughs> so I was up in the mountains following my dream. Mum was left in the camp. Baboons were raiding it because they're very cheeky and move in quickly for any new source of food. Uh, the, there was an old-fashioned tent that we shared, and so the spiders and snakes and things could come underneath. And a, a slightly inebriated cook. <laughs> so she was the brave one, not me. I think your mother goes down on the Mother Hall of Fame for a lot of those reasons. You were up, you mentioned you were up in the forest. Talk a little bit about the beginning. You know, there was no playbook for this. No, nobody had done it before. People often say, you know, who did, who's, whose advice did you follow out? But nobody had done it. However, all my life I'd watched animals. So I'd watched the squirrels, I'd watched the birds, I'd watched every animal I could, and so, it just seemed natural to me, find the chimps. Big problem, they ran away. They'd never seen a white ape before. <laughs> we are white apes, you know, like them. We don't have tails and we biologically are apes. And so eventually one chimpanzee, David Greybeard, began to lose his fear. He had a beautiful white beard. And that never to be forgotten day when I was walking through the forest, mum had just left and I was feeling cold, it had been raining, and there was David crouched over a termite mound, breaking off grass stems and using them to fish for termites, and breaking off leafy twigs and stripping the leaves to make a tool to fish for termites. So if you saw that today, it wouldn't be exciting. But back then it was because science had defined us as the only creature on the planet to use and make tools. We were defined as man, the toolmaker, man, mind you, man, the toolmaker. And I don't know what women were supposed to be, but <laughs> <laughs> they're actually better at using tools in many cases. And so Leakey sent a cable back and said, well, we shall read have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimps as humans. <laughs> <laughs> and that really garnered a tremendous amount of interest after that in the National Geographic. National Geographic came in and sent a photographer, a filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwick. Oh, that guy. That guy. And he filmed all those early observations. So I don't know how many people saw the recent movie Geographic, Jane, but that's all Hugo's footage. And it's, it's survived until now. It's amazing. It's an amazing film. And it's very personal because of the relationship that you and Hugo ultimately had uh, and your beautiful son. Oh, my, my son nicknamed Grub when he was a baby. He was a gorgeous little baby. I mean, wasn't he great as a toddler? And mum's in it. I love that. It's, it's amazing. Mm. And yet you left that paradise. Yes, well, I had to, Leaky told me I had to get a degree and there wasn't time to mess about with the BA, he said. <laughs> so he'd got me a place in Cambridge University to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't know what ethology meant. <laughs> no, you couldn't Google in those days. And so I, I was a bit nervous when I got there. And then many of the professors told me I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimps names. They should have had numbers. I couldn't talk about them having personality, mind capable of any kind of thought, and certainly not emotions, because those were all unique to us. But fortunately, when I was a child, I had a teacher who taught me that in this respect anyway, these wise professors were totally wrong. And that teacher was my dog. <laughs> I mean, you can't share your life, can you, in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a rabbit, a horse, a, a bird, I don't care what it is, and not know the professors were wrong. 
I wish I could have seen the professors at Cambridge faces when you told them your dog knew more than they did about animal behavior. <laughs> so you went back to Tanzania after that, and yes. you expanded your work throughout Africa in terms of yeah. first, research. First built up a, a research station. The best days of my life, out in the rainforest, where you know you realize the interconnectedness of life forms and how each little species plays a part, even though it may seem insignificant, in this web of life. And it w they were the best days of my life. Grub was a little boy. And then I went to this conference in Chicago in 1986, and we brought together by then the people studying chimps in different parts of Africa. And it was a shock. We had a session on conservation, and everywhere, chimp numbers dropping, beginning of the bushmeat trade, you know, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, chimps caught in snares, which they could break the wire, but then they lost a hand or a foot. Uh, mothers shot to capture babies for the illegal wildlife tra animal trafficking. And people overpopulation in the area, people moving into the forest, depriving them of habitat, but also taking in their cattle and disease, because chimps catch all our diseases. So I, uh, we had a session on conditions in the medical research labs, five foot by five foot cages for our closest living relatives, because their bodies are so like ours. You know, we share 90, 98.6% of the composition of DNA with chimps. And, but the scientists were not prepared to accept the equally striking behavioral and biological, uh, the behavioral and psychological um, similarities. And so I went to that conference as a scientist, had my PhD, and I left as an activist. And that's when I began traveling around Africa first, because I think you have to see these things firsthand if you really want to talk in a you know, meaningful way. L learned a lot about the plight of the chimps but also of the people, the abject poverty, the lack of good health and education. And of course, in many places, there was the ethnic violence and there were refugees. And it came to a head, and it was mentioned in that little little clip, flying over Gombe and seeing the completely bare hills. Too many people for the land to support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere. You know, that's when it hit me. We've got to help the people if we want to try and save the chimps. And as you mentioned about the interconnectedness of life in the rainforest, you've really been the leading voice on the interconnectedness of human and animal interaction, and we can't help one without the other. You don't always say which one has helped more, which I think is one of the best parts of your message. So you took your show on the road, so to speak. 300 days a year you travel. I know, because if you try to schedule a cup of coffee with Jane, you have to do about four months out. <laughs> This year's worse, this partly year's worse. because of this conference. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll get to that, too. Uh, <laughs> tell me a little bit about how your message is received, and maybe some, even some surprising places where it's received well. Well, I think it, it's been received well almost everywhere, except one place it really was very difficult for me, and that was talking to people in the research community who experimented on chimps or monkeys. Because, you know, that's the thing. Once science came out of its narrow box, thinking we were the only thinking, feeling beings on the planet, that opened the door for elephants and, and whales and lions and, and, you know, right down. And now we know so much about the in intelligence of, of animals. And it's such an exciting time for any young people wanting to learn animal behavior. You know, even the intelligence of jellyfish. And did you know bumblebees can be trained to roll little balls, and if it drops in a hole, they get a, a nectar reward? So I that's only know because you told me. Uh, well, I told you, but they probably don't know. <laughs> and, but that's, that's amazing enough. But other bumblebees who haven't been taught just by watching the trained ones do the same. Jane, the scientist. So one of the things that you've taught me and scolded me about is don't lose that empathy for these animals and understand that these animals are individuals, which today in conservation, so much of conservation and conservation science is about the impact to us, you know, as we should be scared because our species is at risk because of 
all the different climate change, degradation and biodiversity, uh, the drop in potable water around the world. But you help us understand that we actually have to realize that these animals are creatures too, and they're individual. And you learned that from your dog. I learned that from my dog, and the chimps emphasized it. And I spent a lot of time watching baboons and hyenas, and I've always loved elephants. And, you know, it, it's when most people, when they're talking about conservation, they talk about the species. And there's all these horrible committees who say, well, there are so many of these animals that uh, hunters can have so many, you know, can kill so many. And it, it's horrible because these are individuals. And there was one incident which brought this up into the limelight for a while. And that was when Cecil the lion was shot by a trophy hunter with a, with a bow, you know, a bow thing. Yep. And because Cecil was being studied, because he had a name, that he became a, a sort of symbol. But so when I was writing about it, I said, but just because he had a name doesn't make him any different from the other lions. They have their personalities. They have a place in the lion scheme of things. They have families or brothers or, or whatever. And certainly when you get to elephants, I mean, their social structure, their bonds is just the same as the chimps. They don't wage war, so they're nicer than chimps and us. <laughs> We're pretty low on that species list of who's nice. Another oft ignored group is children. And I've seen firsthand the tremendous personal rapport you have with groups of kids, individuals. Tell me a little bit about Roots and Shoots, how that got started and why. And then we can talk a little bit about now its global reach. Well, uh, when I began in to realize that, you know, working with Takari, that's now in six different countries and means I have to travel around different parts of Africa. And it costs money to do that. So I had to then start traveling around North America. For me, it's raising awareness, but at the same time trying to raise funds to carry on with the work. And so then I began traveling also around Europe and then around Asia, uh, the Middle East. And everywhere I was meeting young people, usually high school, university, who didn't seem to have much hope. And I would kind of talk to them. And they all said more or less the same, we feel this way because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. So you have children you know we've compromised their future with our foolish, thoughtless behavior, with our industrial agriculture, with our GMO crops, with our, with our hunting and too much meat eating, so you destroy the environment to grow the grain and use masses of fossil fuel to get the grain to the animals, to the abattoir, to the table, uh, which is why I carry cow, by the way, because um, these greenhouse gases, of course, they're mostly CO2, but uh, cows illustrate nicely food in, gas out, <laughs> and that's <laughs> methane, and that's a very, very virulent greenhouse gas too. So anyway, it was Chief Seattle who said, and I'm sure when he said it, it was true, because I can't remember how long ago he lived, but he said, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we've borrowed it from our children. But actually, we have been stealing our children's future, and we're still stealing it. But is it too late when the children say there's nothing we can do about it? I thought, that's not true. I'm sure we have a window of time. And there are some scientists who agree with me, particularly climate change ones. Uh, but I don't think it's a very big window. Nobody does. I mean, we are on a downward trajectory. There's no question. But there are ways we can slow it down. And I find the worst problem is people understand now, but they, they don't know what to do. So they, are, they become apathetic. Like, let's bury our heads in the sand and carry on, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The world dies. But if you start realizing what I said in that clip, that every single day, each one of us lives, we make a difference. If we just think about the consequences of what we buy, what we eat, what we wear, how we interact with people or animals or, or the environment, then we start making ethical choices. 
And you know, the fascinating thing is, there's so many similarities between us and the chimps, but we're clearly different. I mean, chimps couldn't organize a conference like this, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Uh, be fun to see, but they probably start fighting. <laughs> Hopefully, we won't. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway. Not the at this session. <laughs> the no, not at this <laughs> session. Others, yes, maybe. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the um, the main difference, I think, is the explosive development of our intellect. I mean, look at this. We could be beaming this conference all around the world. Maybe we are. I don't know. We've sent a rocket to Mars. Little robots crawled around taking photos. And if you've seen those photos, and I bet you have, we don't want to live there. So how is it possible that this most intellectual, notice I don't say wise or clever, but the most intellectual species is destroying its only home. Seems a disconnect between this clever brain and the heart, love and compassion. And I know only when head and heart work in harmony can we achieve our true human potential. So anyway, going back to Roots and Chutes, it began with 12 high school students in Tanzania who were so concerned about things going wrong in their environment, treatment of stray dogs, the homeless children sniffing glue with nobody seeming to care, illegal dynamite fishing, which is destroying the coral reefs, um, uh, poaching in the national parks, and why wasn't the government doing something about it? This was 1991. And so I got them to get their friends. They came from nine different secondary schools. And it was there that Roots and Toots was born with the idea that because everything's interconnected, each group, and they would work in groups, clubs, would choose, th they would choose, we wouldn't tell them. They would choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. But, or they could choose one with all three, but they would talk to each other about their projects. So what began with those 12 high school students in 1991 is now in 100 countries. We've got about 150,000 groups, and a group can be a whole school, which in China is a lot of kids. <laughs> and um, so it's got members in preschool, university, everything in between. We're even in some prisons, and we work with the elderly in their, in their retirement centers. It's changing the world. As you and I are speaking now, and as you're all listening, I hope, um, there are young people all around the world changing the world. And what's incredible about Roots and Shoots is how organic it is. So they get you know, the basics from JGI. They certainly get inspiration from you. And then you have a lot of faith in them and tell them, go do these projects. And they do it. As you said, 150,000 kids around 150, the planet. 150,000 groups, groups of kids. Yeah. That's a big difference. There is a big difference. And <laughs> you've met, it's been going on for so long, you've met several of those kids now as they've grown up and become government ministers and um, teachers, teachers and parents and, and lawyers and and it's, it, it's bound to, but have we got long enough? That's why I have to rush around the world 300 days because, because there's so many places I want to reach. But you know, last year when I was in China, there were people coming up, some of them in government, teachers, parents, saying, well, of course I care about the environment. I was in Roots and Shoots in primary school. So, you know, one of the officials said, Jane, there's no question that program has really uh, helped, had a, um, quite a major part in changing attitudes towards the environment right across China. Well, you've been doing this for a long time. Let's talk a little bit about changing attitudes. Where, where are these pockets of hope that all of us want to hear about right now? Well, my, my reasons for hope are there's five of them. And the first is youth. Because you know we have we have roots and shoots youth leaders who go around, and we have ambassadors who go into the schools, and we get meetings as often as we can, bringing them together. And I, you know, one thing I didn't say about roots and shoots, it's helping to break down the barriers that we build between nations, cultures, religions, old and young, and us and the environment. So. Th that's probably my greatest reason for hope. Then there's this human brain. We're coming up with you know more and more sophisticated, getting cheaper solar power, wind power, and other ways we can live in greater harmony. And thinking about we, each one of us, can live a lighter, 
environmental footprint. And next reason for hope, resilience of nature. If you had shown on that clip go flying over Gombe now, no more bare hills, the trees have come back. And as I sort of hoped at the beginning, all these people have become our partners in conservation. So right from the beginning, we didn't go in a bunch of arrogant white people saying, you know, you've messed things up, this is what we're going to do, this will make your lives better. It was local people. And they went into the village and asked them, what do you think we can do to make your lives better? That's where Takari started. And so growing more food, that meant restoring fertility to the overused land. No chemicals, we, well one, we couldn't afford them, two, I wouldn't have agreed anyway. <laughs> that, you know, so. Um, and then better health and education, working with the local government. Then we could introduce water management to start clearing up the little streams silted by the soil erosion when the trees had gone. We started tree planting and then realized, leave the land alone and those magical seeds in the soil will sprout up again and the forest begins to come back. We don't have to do anything, leave it to Mother Nature. And But other places that we've totally destroyed with a bit of help can be restored. I mean, we all know places like that. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And then the next reason for hope, social media. And I know there's a bad side to it. Well, we all know that now. And, you know, we feel that we're being spied upon if we're not careful with our laptops. Uh, but think for the first time in human history, we can bring people together, people's voices from all around the world about a single issue. So I was in a climate change march in New York, um, organized by Al Gore, and they expected about 80,000 people, and there were 400,000, and I was there so I could see everybody was on their little thing, and some of them on their cell phone, and I could hear them saying, you should come out here, it's great weather, there's a lot of neat people here. One of them said, I just saw Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Another one said, I saw Angelina Jolie, and I promise you this is true, one of them said, Jane Goodall's here. <laughs> so, so anyway. <laughs> For a lot of us, your name would go first, actually. So. That was going on in major cities around the world. And so the time will come when we, the people, will prevail. We've got to try and do it without violence. We have to control those aggressive instincts we probably brought with us from an ancient um, primate, you know, ape-like, human-like creature. But we've got the brains not to do it. We don't use them very well, do we? Not always. No. One of the things that's amazing to me is the structure and the sophistication and the scope of what JGI does today. So you do travel 300 days a year, a year, but you have this organization that's doing all this work, a tremendous amount of conservation work in Africa, working with partner organizations like Global Wildlife. You have scientists working for JGI who are helping local villages live more sustainably with your vision of the environment's not going to work unless the people are healthy and successful. What are some of the areas and what are some of the new focuses that JGI has today? Well, using very sophisticated technology, GIS, GPS, satellite imagery, working with Esri, Digital Globe, um, Google Earth, and now NASA to use sophisticated ways of mapping chimp habitat. So it started around Gombe, and the villagers were completely amazed when these high-resolution maps were shown to them. They'd been making maps drawing on the sand with their fingers. And <coughs> when they saw these high-resolution maps, they were, um, and a woman said, that's the tree I put my baby under when I'm working in the fields. And so seeing these maps, but then what started around Gombe is now moving out into other parts of Africa like Uganda, DRC, Republic of Congo, Burundi. We hope to join up the Gombe Burundi chimps along that rift. And uh, scaled up, plans to scale it up to cover chimp and gorilla range across Africa and then hopefully take it to Asia for the poor old orangutans and gibbons. Um, t teaching villagers, volunteers, how to use smartphones or iTablets 
And even if they can't read and write, they go into the forest. And again, we let them choose. How will you measure the health of your forest? Oh, well, we'll measure illegally cut trees, animal traps. Uh, we'll measure uh, how many times we see a chimp nest or a leopard footprint. And so that's in now 72 villages around Gombe. It's also, I don't know how many villages in Uganda. It's begin beginning to work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, a, lot of, a lot of this actually began with a program in Abu Dhabi called Eye on Earth, which is where I met Jack Dangermond of Esri. And this started the whole thing about involving technology with our wonderful um, science. Uh, he's, he's got a department all on his own at Conservation Science, Lillian Pintea. And he's passionate. And uh, it's, it's just amazing what he's, he made all these contacts. Well, it's great work that you guys are doing and you're really showing a lot of us who do conservation on the ground how that partnership with local people works and how it works well, how it works sustainably, uh, which is so important in conservation. So now you've been traveling for so long. Uh, you are, as the UN has uh, given you this title, an, an ambassador and a messenger for peace. Uh, you know, does your message always get through? Are you ever confounded when you have a meeting with someone or you're in a new country where maybe people aren't quite as open to this idea of conservation, hope, sustainability? How do you break through in those situations? Well, the only way, and of course I can't always break through, obviously, but the best way I've found my mother taught me, if you meet somebody who disagrees with you, number one, listen, because maybe they got some ideas you never thought of. Maybe you think, oh, I see. Well, that's where I'm wrong. But providing that you've finished listening to them and you still think you're right or, or righter than they are, <laughs> then the only way I've found to get through is certainly not to be confrontational, because then people stop listening, but to tell stories to reach this heart which is within each one of us, you know. And so in y using this, this technology or this, this way of, of interacting with people, sometimes they don't tell you at the time, but I hear later. They write to me or one of their children or something says, you changed dad um, just because of your stories. It's amazing. So 300 days a year, it still boggles my mind. What's but your next? But Brian, Mr. H will be really upset if I don't introduce him with my fifth reason of hope. Remember I said I had five? Yes, you're right. I the cut you off. One. Yeah, you did. Well, but for a good I've reason. I've done it before. <laughs> you see, we're good friends, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's no good having a discussion like this if you're not good friends. Uh, that is then true. it becomes That's why we're confrontational. <laughs> and I've just said that doesn't work. <laughs> but luckily, we think the same. <laughs> anyway, um, my fifth reason for hope is the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle the impossible or seemingly impossible and manage to succeed or uh, raise enough awareness that it will, their idea will succeed in the end. And Mr. H was given to me 28 years ago by a man called Gary Horn. Uh, who went blind in the U.S. Marines when he was 21, decided to become a magician, was told you can't be a magician if you can't see. If he was here now, you wouldn't know he was blind. And so he'll, he does shows for kids, and at the end he'll tell them and say, you know, something may go wrong in your life, because we never know, but don't give up. There's always a way forward. And he does scuba diving, cross-country skiing, skydiving. Most amazing, he's just taught himself to paint. <laughs> Never painted before. And there's a picture of Mr. H, a portrait. He never seen him, but he's felt him. It's amazing. He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee, and I took his hand and made him hold the tail. He said, oh, well, I know chimps don't have tails, but... I'm sorry, I didn't feel, I can't <laughs> see. <laughs> Take him with you and you know I'm with you in spirit. And he travels with you every day? Travels 
all over the world. And, you know, this indomitable spirit, we see it in, in people with tremendous physical disabilities that I would feel I would curl up and hide away. And there they are, inspiring people. Man in Canada, Chris Cock, with no legs and no arms, little arms this long, one foot-like thing. He went all around Europe alone on a skateboard. Uh, just an incredible person. And then people who come in as migrants with nothing and yet somehow get a life together and will smile at you if you bother to listen to their story. So this indomitable human spirit, you know, of enough of us, and of course that's what Roots and Shoots message. So what's your next adventure? Well, my next adventure, you know, as you know, I've just turned 84. I'm still fortunately healthy, one gift, well, I I'm not sure why you're clapping. <laughs> anyway, um, I was gifted with a, a healthy constitution, so I can still do it, and I will do it as long as I can. I'm just glad you let me sit down here. Sometimes when we do this, we just stand the whole time. Well, that's because the people at the back couldn't see, but we're higher. Thank so goodness, I Mike, think, listen. I think you can all see if you put your heads to one side of it. So... Um, I'll carry on as long as I can. But I guess the next great adventure for me will be dying. Oh, Jean. No, but, but listen, when you die, there's either nothing, in which case, well, it's nothing, that's the end, um, or there's something, in which case that will be a great adventure. Uh, I happen to believe there's something. We all believe differently. But, you know, before I die, I want to make sure that all this work that I've struggled with and all these people who, who are following, you know, it must go on. It has to go on after I'm dead. And you have established this legacy fund now to help make sure and ensure that JGI and a lot of your work is going to persist yes, for a long time. Finally. Far, far, we're going to have all that work done, by the way, before you go on that journey. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got, to, I've got to stay here till this is properly launch, but then people say, well, then I'm not going to give you any money. <laughs> 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 no, um, it's it's now, it's a Jane Goodall Legacy Foundation. It's separate from the JGIs because it will f support all of them. Uh, it's got, it's registered in Geneva as a proper uh, NGO. It's got all its tax things sorted out. It's got a bank. Um, I think w it w the idea... That's actually harder to do, having a bank account in Switzerland these days. So that's actually... Well, an we have an amazing person working for us. Good. And Just don't um, tell them they're Americans or yeah, anything Yeah, like and the whole idea was born in Abu Dhabi, talking to the Crown Prince and some of his people in the Environment Agency. So, you know, we're hoping to launch it with a lead gift soon. I was promised one yesterday, actually. Oh, good. Mm. See, all these dinners are worthwhile. So you're here at this kind of fancy event, the Milk and Global Conference, with a lot of influential and powerful people. What's your, what's your message to them? Well, my message to them is, you know, basically the same as I've said. Remember that you make a difference every day, and the more powerful that you are, the more important it is that you make ethical decisions and think about the future. Because some of these people definitely care about their children, their grandchildren, and yet they are acting in a way that is compromising the health of their children and the future of their children. So, you know, the message is just think of the consequences of every decision you make. Well, I want to play a video which is very hopeful and shows that power of restoration and maybe we can talk about it tee it up a little bit and I know some folks have some questions for you so if you have time for us we'll do that afterwards so we do the video after the questions. well we'll do the video now we'll do the video now okay well we happen to have the largest sanctuary in Africa for orphan chimps mostly orphaned by the bushmeat trade and it's got a hundred and it's about a hundred and seventy chimps now many of them adult and it's very expensive caring for them, but you know, we, we, we have no option. We try and we hope to get some back into the wild. So this video, many of you may have seen it, but 
for me, it was the most moving event, I think, in my whole life. And when it actually happened, everybody there was had tears in their eyes. That's right. It was magical. This is a really exciting moment for me. The Jane Goodall Institute Chimpunga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center in the Republic of Congo has for years been caring for infants whose mothers were killed, mostly for the illegal bushmeat trade. Many of them are now fully grown. Recently, we acquired three large forested islands on the beautiful Quilu River, where we can release many of the chimpanzees from our overcrowded center. In here is Wunda, and she nearly died, but thanks to Rebecca, she came back from the dead. And here she is, about to come out into this paradise. She's the 15th chimpanzee to get her freedom here. And we hope, ultimately, to have about 60 on the island. Today is the first time I've met Wunda. I talked to her on the boat, trying to reassure her. She must have wondered what was happening. None of us could predict exactly what she would do once the cage door opened. It was a very, very touching moment. One of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. The warmth of her embrace is something I shall never forget. For Wunda and all the other chimpanzees we're working to bring here, Chinzula Island will provide a wonderful forest home where they will be cared for and safe. So the, the final word, well, hopefully not final, but the final at the moment, bringing it up to date. Um, our chimpanzee females in the sanctuary, they're all on, have um, implants because we can't have more babies. They're still, the three new ones came in just last week. So we can't afford more babies being born in our sanctuary. We simply haven't got room. And the islands aren't huge. So they're in, they have implants. Out of all these years, one implant went wrong, and that was Wunda. <laughs> and she safely had a baby on the island. She's the dominant female of 30, even dominates the males at the moment, although I don't think that'll last for long. <laughs> and mother and baby are doing fine. The baby's now two, and we've called her Hope. It's amazing. I think we have some time for questions if people want to ask some questions and there's we have a mic going around. So yeah, maybe we can start up here and Hi Jane. It's a pleasure to meet you from this far away. Uh, I was just in Rwanda a few months ago and hiking with the, the gorillas and uh, was with the gorilla doctors and American or African Wildlife Foundation and I'm curious whether the organizations get together and talk to governments about you know, getting more land. When I was there, Paul Kagame was just at a, an event to get a little more piece of the park, I guess, uh, uh, where the gorillas are. And I wonder what that's, what's happening globally with you guys talking to different governments around Africa, too. Well, the trouble is that the different African countries have different governments and different presidents. And some presidents are 
you know, understand conservation is important. Usually, I'm afraid, it's because of the economic benefit of tourism. Not always, but very often. And the countries I've had to, to deal with, Tanzania, has been, it has a lot of land set aside for conservation, but that doesn't mean there isn't illegal hunting. It, it's the elephants and rhinos and pangolins that are suffering now, horribly suffering. Uh, and that's all over the world. But um, talking to the government officials in uh, Congo, Brazzaville, the Republic of Congo, we got this, these islands the government gave us, also established a huge area of forest known as the Gulogo Triangle, which was once surrounded by swamps, so not even the pygmies got in there. And I, I've been there, and it's just amazing to stand by a 2,000-year-old tree and know that it's never heard the sound of a chainsaw and animals who've never seen people before. So it, it varies from government to government. But for example, in Tanzania, around Gombe's tiny. It's only 35 square miles. But we're now trying to get the whole area where there are still are some wild chimps left uh, designated as protected. But a lot of it's through the work of the villagers. Hi, um, I want to ask you about uh, veganism, a vegan diet, and if that's part of something you speak about or promote, and both for the environment and obviously for animals, and obviously about 30% of the teenagers I know right now are vegans and, and how that's very much rising in our youth. Yeah. Well, I, I mainly talk about the importance of being a vegetarian because you can't suddenly expect people who've lived all their lives on meat and, and eggs and fish and everything to suddenly stop. But I think when people become vegetarian, they start thinking, well, well but when I became a vegetarian, I felt so much better. And, you know, people say, well, you can't live on a vegetarian diet. Well, look at me. And if I lived in one place, I would be a vegan. But when you're traveling the way I do, it's so difficult, even sometimes, to be a vegetarian. And so I think it starts people thinking. And if we eat less and less meat, then we have less of these horribly cruel, intensive farms. And if anybody goes to one, I don't think they ever want to eat meat again. Yeah, and factory farming, as I'm sure you know, since you seem very excited about uh, plant-based diets, is one of the biggest contributors to environmental degradation on the planet. And that's certainly something that Houses, Jane has yes. spent a lot of time on advocating against. And really, you know, not just the environmental damage, <laughs> but also the impact to the animals themselves. Another question? And they have personalities too. Pigs happen to be cleverer than most dogs. And if you haven't seen this, um, Google it afterwards. Google um, not Picasso, but Pig Casso, and you'll be amazed. <laughs> Another question? Or some up front. Uh, hi, Jane. M my name's Paul Hinks. I think you might remember. Yes, me. of course. We were friends 30 years ago. Yeah. And uh, it's great to see you. And I haven't seen you since in all those years. I lived in Tanzania, uh, just yeah, down the you beach. Knew him quite well. Just down the beach yeah. from Jane. And yeah. my former wife was uh, worked with Jane for many years. Um, it's, so it's brilliant to see you. I have one question. What's Grub up to these days? <laughs> Grub is designing low-cost... Um, absolutely amazing design houses that withstand hurricanes and earthquakes unless the ground opens up beneath them. Um, they look fantastic. Uh, he can put up a five-room, two-story house, hasn't done it yet, but theoretically, in a week. And the, the roof and the, and the um, foundation, all done in one on the spot. And it's environmentally friendly. Thank you. Another question? Up front again. It, all the questions are in the front. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I was curious, when, whenever you see some of the atrocities and things you've seen, I'm, it's horrifying. And, and the first probably instinct is to make rules to keep it from happening. And then you progress to this, this attitude of changing the lives of the peop 
people around to make their lives better, to bring them up to a higher standard. And I think that's what a lot of this whole Milken Institute's about. Um, when, when did you have that realization that in order to help <clears throat> nature and the environment and the chimpanzees and all that, that the way to help was actually bringing the people up around with, with programs like you've created as opposed to just purely making well, rules? How, how, would, how did that transpire? It was, you know, when I was going around Africa trying to learn more about what was going on and flying over Gombe and seeing those bare hills, that's when the realization dawned on me. And, you know, that Takari program has been so successful that, as I say, the villagers provided, uh, they provided volunteers to go and monitor the forest, the village forest reserves. So the first thing they did was to put land aside to create a buffer around Gombe so that it would protect chimps from people and people from chimps. And then other villagers were setting land aside to make a, a leafy corridor so that, that there could be movement between the Gombe chimps, which had been cut off and genetically challenged because there's only a hundred, less than a hundred chimps at Gombe. And now we, we got two new females coming in from outside, so our corridor is beginning to work. The corridors are tremendously important. So, you know, the more I travel around, talk to people, listen to people, um, the more people ask questions, because sometimes they ask questions, you think, gosh, I never thought of that, I better find out. So, it, you know, Takari is working. And as I say, we're now in six other African countries with helping the people. Maybe one last one. Uh, he hello, my name's Carol. Um, I wanted to thank you. I grew up in Kenya, and I, your, your book, In the Shadow of Man, was my favorite book growing up, so I'm very happy to be here today um, in terms of the inspiration it provided. Uh, today I work with the Milken Institute, and we run a training program for policymakers from developing countries, a lot of them from Africa, uh, which VISTA actually has kindly supported as well. Uh, these poli policymakers come to the U.S., and then they go back to try and build up their financial markets and their capital markets. And we often talk about the links between functioning financial markets and good systems and employment, but we talk slightly less, and hopefully we will do more, about the links between a functioning financial system and uh, environmental conservation. And so if uh, my students who are here, some of whom are here today, had key questions, what is one thing that a policymaker, and it goes back to the government question before, could do if they're not working in an environmental space, but what if they're working in finance, what is one thing they could do to help conservation in this system in their country? I, w I wonder if you could answer that. <laughs> well, you work within that A little field bit, more yeah. than I do. Well, thank you. That Milken program is amazing, and it's inspired in the sense of unle un unless and until you have people who have been given an opportunity to understand how these capital markets work and work in a functioning way, they're not going to be able to go back and build a brighter future for their own home markets. From an, a governmental standpoint, uh, Jane spends a lot of time giving hope and lecturing folks sometimes on what they should be doing, but she's more enlightened than most and has more patience than most of us. So I, I spend some of my time uh, doing the less patient lecturing of some of our elected officials. And what I continue to try and tell them is listen to our scientists. And it's incredible, and I'm sure it's different outside of the United States, but maybe not much, how much policy is done without consulting informed scientists. And our elected officials are very talented legislators, and many of them have a legal background. But as an investor, I would never buy a software company without having my tech people explain to me exactly how the technology works and what the impact of that technology is to the broader ecosystem. You know, that's what tells me whether or not something's defensible. And unfortunately, I think what we've seen time and again is even our inspired politicians who want to make a difference don't always interact with the right people to tell them how to make a difference. And so that's what I would tell them. Spend more time with your scientists. It, well, with that I just can say, you know, it's interesting that so often people who are very environmentally conscious, conscientious, 
you know, they spent a lot of time blaming big corporations for destroying forests or polluting the ocean and so forth. A lot of time blaming politicians for making the wrong decision. But at least in a democracy, we elect the politicians and we, if we buy the products, we shouldn't point fingers at the company. So we have more power than we think if everybody uses their voice. And in elections, everybody must vote and not just become apathetic and say, well, I don't care anymore. I think that's a great way to end it. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>